Hello and welcome to week three, part one of EGM 703, Principles of Microwave Remote Sensing. In this lesson, we'll learn about a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we haven't really worked with before, the microwave spectrum. Through the rest of this week, we'll cover microwave interaction with the atmosphere and Earth's surface and start talking about active remote sensing in the form of radar. There's also a supplemental lesson on complex numbers. It's there as an introduction in case you haven't worked with complex numbers before, as they really are quite useful when working with microwave remote sensing generally and synthetic aperture radar in particular. Up until now, we focused our intention on visible and infrared wavelengths between roughly 400 nanometers and about 35,000 nanometers. For microwave remote sensing, we're going to be looking at the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum with wavelengths ranging from about one millimeter to one meter. In the literature especially, you may see frequency discussed more often than wavelength. Microwaves have a frequency ranging from about 300 gigahertz at the high end up to about 300 megahertz at the low end. Now remember, one hertz is just one cycle per second, so even the slower frequencies are very high. One megahertz is one million cycles per second. Finally, similar to what we've seen for the visible and infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, the microwave spectrum can also be divided up into different bands or regions corresponding to similar enough properties. And we'll see this a bit more next week when we talk about applications of radar remote sensing. So we've seen this slide already when we discussed thermal remote sensing, but I wanted to show it again to highlight the phase or partial wavelength. For the different forms of passive remote sensing that we've covered up until now, we've mostly ignored this aspect of electromagnetic radiation. When we discuss active microwave remote sensing, such as radar and synthetic aperture radar, however, this is going to become important because it contains information about how far away the target or object that we're observing is from the sensor. Light is a transverse wave. That is, the electric and magnetic components of the wave oscillate per perpendicular to the direction of motion. We can therefore define or specify an orientation for this oscillation, which we call the polarization of the wave. By convention, we normally define the polarization using the electric component of the wave. So in this top example, the wave is vertically polarized. The electric field is oriented along the x-axis in the x-z plane. In the second example, the electric field is still propagating along the x-axis, but it is oscillating in the x-y plane. We would say that this is horizontally polarized. Light can be polarized at any arbitrary angle. It can even have a circular or elliptical polarization where the plane is rotating around the direction of motion. And just as a side note, the fact that electromagnetic waves have a polarization is something that we frequently use in microwave and radar remote sensing. Because of this, we can actually construct filters that will only allow through light at a specified polarization. This is especially useful, again, for radar remote sensing, where the polarization of the signal partly determines what we actually see with the signal. We can also use this to create glare-reducing polarized sunglasses, or even 3D glasses for watching movies. We can also combine or add together waves. You might also see this combination referred to as superposition or interference. If you've ever thrown multiple stones or pebbles into a body of water, you've actually seen this in action. Mathematically, we write this as a simple addition. The combined wave, psi, is just the addition of psi 1 and psi 2, shown here. What this actually looks like, however, may be very difficult to visualize because the amplitudes, frequencies, and phase shifts of the different waves are often very different. In general, we can talk about two main types of interference based on the phase shift between the two waves. If the phase shift is not an odd multiple of pi, then we have something called constructive interference. 
the waves add together in a way that increases the overall amplitude of the wave. The example here, with the phase shift of zero between the wave on top and the wave on the bottom, shows how this works. The peaks and the troughs of these two waves align because there's no shift in phase between them, and the result is that the total amplitude of the combined wave is the sum of the amplitudes of the individual component waves. If, however, the phase shift is an odd multiple of pi, we have something called destructive interference. The example here shows what this looks like for a phase shift of pi. The troughs of the first wave align with the peaks of the second wave, with the result being that the two waves completely cancel each other out. The combined wave has an amplitude of zero. Of course, most of our examples won't be quite this simple, which is where complex numbers can be very useful. Because we can express electromagnetic waves as a complex number, and because we can express complex numbers as vectors, the combination of waves is just vector addition, which is usually a bit easier to visualize than trying to add together sines and cosines. So let's say that we have a wave, psi1, which we can describe as a vector with a real part and an imaginary part. And as a side note, if this is all Greek to you, I encourage you to watch the supplemental lesson on complex numbers, which will hopefully help clear things up. Let's say we have a second wave, psi2, which is also a vector that has a real and an imaginary part. The sum of these two waves, which we called psi on the previous slide, is just the sum of the vector representations of the two component waves. Again, this way of thinking about waves as being complex vectors is mostly a technique to make the math and the visualization less complicated. The last topic that we'll cover in this first lesson is coherence. If the phase differences between two vectors or two waves are constant over time, then we say that those waves or those vectors are coherent. Because we can treat time-varying signals as a vector that rotates in time, again, see the supplemental lesson for more detail here, this means that the angular frequencies of these two vectors, or the frequencies of the two waves, are the same. This also means that we can treat them as stationary vectors. Because the differences aren't changing in time, we can add them together without worrying about what time we're actually observing. So for example, if we have a number of different vectors, we can add them together like we showed on the previous slide. We start with this first vector here, we add a second vector, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, and that's probably enough for now. So the resulting vector, or wave, is, just, is still just the sum of all of these different vectors. And we'll see this more when we talk about synthetic aperture radar later this week. Another way to think about coherence is that it's like a measure of predictability. If we have high coherence, that means that the phase difference between the two vectors or the two images is constant, and we can predict the result of interference by adding these two vectors together. If, on the other hand, we have low coherence, that means we have a changing phase difference and it's less predictable because it depends on time. One way to measure coherence is by using cross-correlation, usually done over a small window around a pixel in an image. For radar applications in particular, high coherence between images acquired at different times tells us that the surface is not changing very much, and this also helps us apply a number of techniques that we'll cover next week. In this lesson, we've recapped how electromagnetic radiation is a self-propagating wave, and we'll explain what we mean by this a bit more in the next lesson. We saw how we can combine or interfere different waves, and how this can be easier to visualize if we think about waves as complex numbers. Finally, we've covered how life is much easier when the phase difference between waves is constant over time, a property known as coherence. You can read more about the topics we've discussed here in the textbooks, Lewis and Kiefer and Chipman, Chapter 6.6. I've included a link to a video that pro provides a great, non-mathy explanation of Maxwell's equations, which are the fundamental equations that underpin the theory of electromagnetism, which is what has allowed for the development of electronics, remote sensing, and a whole host of other things.
I've also included a link to a good video that talks about the polarization of light. It provides a little bit more detail than we go into here, but it does help explain why things like polarized sunglasses or 3D movies work the way they do. There's also a link to the course material for GEO 657 at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, put together by Dr. Franz Meyer. The material in that course, of course, is significantly more detailed than we're able to get through in two weeks, but if this is a topic that interests you, I very much recommend it, and it's a great resource to have online. Finally, I've included a link to a short article titled Grand Challenges in Microwave Remote Sensing which provides an overview of both the state of the field of microwave remote sensing, as well as some of the challenges that we still face. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!